Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Event Industry News Podcast. My name is James Dixon. Wishing, as ever, a very good morning, afternoon, or evening, whenever or wherever you tune into today's podcast from. Welcome along to the show, everybody. And in a couple of seconds' time, a very, very warm welcome to our guest today. And I've already got a great vibe about today's guest. I know that it's going to be a great conversation, um, and, and we're going to have a bit of fun whilst doing it. Um, because they're, they're, they're joining us, first of all, Transatlantic, which is something that I'm always excited about. I get to talk to people in that great country that is the USA. Um, and we're going to be talking today about um, CRM systems, about payments, about virtual events. And we're going to be talking about how all of those sort of things tie in together and how companies who have um, CRM systems, specifically the Salesforce system, can maybe uh, expand their horizons maybe is a nice way of putting it um to find out more and to tell us uh, a little bit about what they do and then to answer some questions and hopefully have a great chat is the director of technology evangelism and product marketing at blackthorn.io is my new friend mr matt frank matt very warm welcome to the event industry news podcast hey james great to be here thank you so much for having me we had a little chat off air, Matt and I, uh, just before we hit record on this, and and you know we both we both have dogs in the house whilst we're recording, so you know we do these things and we have to go through the whole the whole charade of of convincing the dogs to leave the recording area <laughs> while we, while we're doing that sort of thing, and 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 we spoke about Matt's time in London, then we remembered ah we are actually here to record a, a podcast and hopefully right. offer some some insight and education to the people who tune in to this here uh, podcast that we like to put out once a week and. As I said at the start, Matt, CRM systems, nothing new to, to most people out there. I'm sure most of our podcast uh, followers will have used a CRM system of some description at some oh, point. Yeah. Today, we're very much specifically talking about the Salesforce system, which is, you know, it, it's synonymous in some respects. You know, it's used globally. Big organizations will know and have used. And most people out there will have had some experience of no doubt of Salesforce at some point in their time. What we need to really tell them about today is 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 what you guys do at Blackthorn, first of all, and how that works alongside Salesforce. So first of all, tell us a little bit about yourself um, and and who and what Blackthorn provides. Yeah. So uh, as you very expertly stated at the beginning, I'm Matt Frank. I'm our director of technology evangelism here at Blackthorn. And I've been in the Salesforce world for the better part of a decade now. Uh, and before that, I did a lot of work during program management, event directorship, uh, and educational programs for uh, universities, other higher ed uh, institutions, mm -hmm. charities, and nonprofits, but uh, also a little bit of financial services consultancy there as well. So sort of hit around all the houses when it comes to all those <laughs> different perspectives. Um, and I've come to work at Blackthorn for the past year and a half or so uh, because it's a fantastic tool that is a partner to Salesforce in the best possible way. And by that, I mean it encourages engagement regardless of the industry that you're in. So it's event management and conference management, payment processing, all completely native on top of Salesforce. And by native, I mean you're not using an integration tool. There's not an API. There's not a middleware connector that's sometimes supported and sometimes not supported. And we can talk about data loss later on and how that can affect business. But mm. it's all designed to bring your events, your conferences, your board meetings, your committee meetings, your trade shows, all of that into Salesforce, the payments, uh, the engagement data, connect it through to your stakeholders, whether they're customers, donors, VIPs who are coming into your building, and for you as an organization to then be able to action that data in real time and pivot in real time if you need to, to provide the best possible experience for your customers and stakeholders. Will there be people out there who use Salesforce who don't yet realize that they can use it as a base for a great event? Yes. Simply put, yes, uh, there is. You know, the, the Salesforce as a global organization is the largest CRM system in the world. I mean, they even uh, trade on the stock exchange as CRM, right? That's their yeah. handle. They're, they are sort of synonymous with that term. Uh, but the double-edged sword sort of uh, view of that success is that the customer base is so broad that there'll be many people who will realize that the app exchange, which is sort of like the, the app store on your phone or the Google mm -hmm. store on your phone, uh, many people won't realize the benefits and the breadth 
of that app exchange and what it can do for them as a business when they start to bring all of that data and all of those uh, applications together in one place. Sure. And, 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 when I was reading, uh, doing a bit of reading before this uh, today's podcast, and I won't, I won't, you know, pretend that I, I spend hours and hours prepping for these. Anybody's listened to them will know that that's far from the truth. But straight away, I'm thinking data is yeah. already there in Salesforce. Yeah, you know, registration processes for events. Right, they collect data. Well, hold on, if we can streamline the registration process and then it merges straight into Salesforce and it tells you straight away if a client has registered for your event next time you go to contact them about something that's unrelated. Yeah. You know, the simple day-to-day -day sort of tasks and and, and they seem to be immediately, I, get, I bet if you and I sat down with a list, we could probably write down a list of 30 things straight off the bat Oh, yeah. Be improved just by having that synergy between the data that's already there and how we run events. Oh, totally. I mean, that's everything from opt ins uh, so that you can remain GDPR compliant or double or triple opt in, depending upon which country uh, you might be gathering that event data from. Uh, there's ensuring that you get paid in real time or you set up payment plans in real time so that both your stakeholders and you as an organization know exactly who's paying what and when, whether that's a sponsor or a registrant or a donor of some capacity. Mm -hmm. uh, you immediately have updated data directly from the source on contact records or business records inside your CRM. And because you're using a cloud-based secure tool to really manage all of that data, you can ensure that any personally identifiable data, things that you really only want a certain segment of your staff to be able to access, mm -hmm. it adheres to the profile-based and role-based permissions you've already got set up. In, sure. your, uh, in your system, right? So you're already leveraging a system you've set up to manage client data. Now you're just doing it in a more expanded capacity, which is really smart business at the end of the day. It, it, it is. And the, the other thing that, that, that got me thinking um, prior to our recording was, was the, the platform process, as I'm going to yeah. term it, with, with virtual and with hybrid event platforms now, yep. which have become, you know, they, they boomed. Let's not dress it up. They, they, they boomed, you know, since oh, yeah. the pandemic for obvious reasons, all of which we've spoken about on this podcast. Um, but the, the process of creating an event platform, you know, starts with, with you know, getting people to register and then you've got to input data. You have to build it. You have to populate it in, in some way. And, uh, you know, it, are there ways of, of, of tying in what you guys do with stuff, again, that's existing in Salesforce that straight away make processes like that just that little bit simpler to, to, to sort of populate an event platform? Yeah, absolutely. So let me take a, a step back and then I'll take a step forward to answering your question, if that's okay. So a lot of times, uh, dedicated event management systems that are not part of or incorporated with a core CRM system, mm -hmm. they tend to try to be their own CRM system in their own right, right? Yes. So, right, they, they know how they want to manage their own data, and it's all particularly funneled or created in a capacity so that the data table is is readily available for the event manager, which is great for the event manager or the event producer or director who is trying to manage that one individual event. That is terrible for the business overall. You have to be able to translate that data between multiple systems. You have to be able to create custom fields to hold data where it doesn't initially exist. Yeah, I, I bring all of that up to say, you know, having all that data in a, a dedicated event tool is fantastic, but it doesn't allow you to initiate automation processes for communication channels within your CRM, right? Salesforce has great tools like Marketing Cloud, which lets you set up journeys for people depending upon when they want, when and how they interact with you. And events are a part of that. If you're storing this event data off platform, you can't incorporate it into a journey in the same way, a communication channel. If you have VIPs coming to a building that you own, let's say you work at a stock exchange or so, you know a large scale financial services building and the CEO of one of your major traded companies comes in, you want to be able to know that immediately. You want to be able to send the right people to the right room. And because you have the data knowing that they like cucumber in their water as opposed to lime in their water once they get to the <laughs> room, 
able to action on that immediately. Now, I realize that's sort of a, a silly scenario there, but having the data in one place allows you to create the bespoke and personalized experiences that many of your event stakeholders and registrants have come to expect. Uh, and having to wait for batch integrations overnight or manual integrations by hand and possibly losing some of that data along the way sets you up for failure from the start. So the benefit to here of having it all in one place is that you can action on that data immediately using the automation tools you've already built out to manage that data within your core business. Do, do people, is there, um, I suppose, an edu educational process that you have to work through with your clients to get them to understand exactly how the two elements interact? And I, I guess in some respects, you're wanting people to use your element Mm -hmm. but sometimes not even know that they're using it because they're Salesforce users. Is that, yeah. Would that be a right thing, a correct thing to say? Yeah, more or less. So when you were to log, if you were to log into Salesforce and you were to select the Blackthorn apps for event management, it would look and feel just like Salesforce. And that's intentional. Yeah. Uh, we also know that there are a wide, wide breadth of users with a wide breadth of technical expertise uh, that are going to be coming and using this tool for the first time, right? Yeah. We've got event managers who have never touched Salesforce before, and we've got advanced architects and developers and these really powerful technical people who can do technical things, and it's very exciting and I, wizardry even to me. <laughs> um, and they also want to be able to get that same experience and data out of the tool. So how do we build it in such a way that it can bridge the gap, right? Yeah. Um, so we want it to look and feel like Salesforce, but we also build all of our applications with an ethos behind it that if you have to read the documentation on how to use it, we've built it too complicated. Right. And we do that regardless of whether it's events, whether it's SMS, whether it's uh, payment processing, or even the data compliance app. It's all designed to be really simple to use. And that's intentional by design so that if you are new to Salesforce, if you're uncomfortable using new technologies, maybe you've been doing things Excel is the, you know, the, <laughs> the, the most advanced <laughs> you've ever gotten with the computer. Yeah. Um, we've built this in such a way that you, intuitively you can log in, you can go, okay. If I click on the wizard, I can add all of my different ticket types, my pricing rules. I can send invitations. I can set up sessions. I can assign speakers to it, right? We can assign rooms. It's designed intentionally so that you know exactly what you're doing when you log in. And it's not this big, scary thing of, oh, I have to learn all of Salesforce to be able to use this. No, you just have to know where setup is, where your login is, and that's all there is to it. It, it it sounds like, like we're simplifying a, a process that for many people has become quite complicated because I, yeah. I've seen examples of uh, event organizers using multiple platforms mm -hmm. to do different things, you know, that, that they have, you know, Google calendars, they have a CRM system, they have yep. Slack channels, they have WhatsApp groups, they have email, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Yep. And if you ask the average event organizer, yeah, how many how many different channels of communication do you have with different elements and different parties related to your event? I'm sure for the most part you're talking at least a half dozen. Um, Easily. And, and 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 I'm just wondering whether or not this this sort of process as well is simplifying that the, the amount of platforms that we're reliant on to manage mm -hmm. things like tasks, diaries, notifications, messages, email. Yeah, you're we're simplifying that to the nth degree and it's all coming into one place and that's something i really love about it when i used to run event actually i used to work for another salesforce partner and we had uh two different conferences that we did for our partners and our users mm -hmm. um and uh, as a company you know i planned the one in london because that's where i lived at the time uh we had someone else planning the one in the u.s it was coordinating vendors, it was coordinating hotels, it was coordinating speakers, it was coordinating Salesforce staff, our partners. And as you said, I probably had six or eight different channels going on. And because of that, it led to frustration with my team. A lot mm -hmm. of frustration with my team, right? Because I'd be WhatsApping uh, with a group of speakers coming from, let's say Salesforce. Yep. But 
because that was on my mobile, that wasn't on anybody else's mobile, <laughs> uh, the person who was handling uh, where the catering should go and the different green rooms or backstage rooms that I had, they didn't know exactly where to put it at which time and that this was a group of vegans, not a group of meat eaters, right? <laughs> <laughs> and that was all because it was only in my mobile and it was only in their mobile. Right. It wasn't in a core system that we were all working from and it wasn't automatically being added to Slack or it wasn't automatically being counted as an activity against the event or it wasn't setting up push alerts to anybody else on the team. By bringing all of that together, everyone's working from the same data and they're yeah. doing it in the same time. So you actually have the ability to collaborate. It also means you're not waiting. You said multiple platforms. This is really true. Right. You're not waiting for things to sync. You can set up near real-time syncs with a lot of different systems. And that's great if you have the API thresholds to be able to maintain that. Although mm -hmm. sometimes there's things called governor's limits that you can reach, which can cause problems in their own, right? Yep. Um, but by having all of the data in real time in one place, and it's the common data structure that you were already working from before the event started, I mean, you know exactly where to look, regardless of where who you are on the team. It simplifies the process for everybody and it creates a more enjoyable experience because me as the event director, I'm not then having to copy all the data off of individual WhatsApps or individual emails, compile them into a mega communication <laughs> uh, that then goes out to the team, which half of them won't read until after it's no longer relevant anyways. It's yeah. already there and it's already in one place and by the time someone logs in, they may actually be able to see the updated communications that I've sent out afterwards rather than the old ones that I set out before. Hmm. It, it's, it's, I'm going to pull out something that I read in your bio that was sent to me prior to, to, to today. And it was um, a, a goal to empower organizations with apps that delight and simply put, just work. Yeah. And, and the just work bit really jumped out at me because we've i've all seen organization or organizers uh and event producers lose valuable time because stuff that they're using stops working yeah or they find a glitch in the system that the developer had never spotted before yep. and it's now going to take a week to route around that or reprogram it to fix that glitch so that it can yep. do what the person wants. we've all been there and i think I'm, I'm i'm hoping that people listen to this today are all going yeah yeah i've been there yeah i yeah. lost half a day because that didn't work there yep. and it set me back and i end up working until 2 a.m to try and catch up yeah finding stuff that just works we should not underestimate just how simple a thing that sounds but just how important it is in the world of events we work in in time scales here our events have a deadline we can't just push them back by a week because we've reached a couple of problems during the production and the and the, the, the planning of it yeah. that event is going to happen on that date whether we like it or not so lost yeah. time lost time is is critical oh it's 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 huge it's absolutely huge and think about how much time you've spent or your audience has spent over the years trying to create workarounds for issues that should have been non-issues to begin with and how much time that's taken away from the rest of the event execution or planning process right mm -hmm. you haven't been able to go thank the the chairman of the board of the charity that you're working with uh for being there and shaking their hand because you're too busy worrying about check-ins at sessions that are being used for cpd right uh, yeah. for or cme credits yeah yeah, yeah. Right. That comes down at the end of the day to choosing an application and a platform for that application that actually engages with the audience it's attempting to serve when it's building out those applications. Yep. And that's actually something at Blackthorn that even before I became an employee that I loved about the company. I, I used to see uh, Chris, the CEO of of Blackthorn would post on uh, YouTube and LinkedIn and Twitter all these all the time these very honest posts about uh, things he did wrong uh, when he first founded the company or things he's done right and a lot of times those would include engaging customers and engaging audiences when uh, the product is being developed refined QA'd and tested mm -hmm. right and so that 
same bug that you mentioned in your example of, oh, a developer never thought of this scenario and therefore this was never tested for. And then it created a bug for me on the day of my event that's solved for. I'm never going to say 100% of the time. I think anybody who works in technology is <laughs> yeah, yeah, like 100% you'd be a, flying. You'd be a bold man. Right? But I would say we're we're very good about it. And it's we engage customers in beta trials. We engage customers in the QA process. We engage customers in pre-release um, testing rounds so that anything that, even though we come from an events background and a Salesforce background, uh, there's, we aren't going to be able to cover 100% of the scenarios. And there are things and ways that our customers would be able to use it, uh, use the events application specifically that we would have never envisioned. Yeah. And so being able to solve for those, what are for them very commonplace scenarios very quickly is, is one of the things I'm really proud of. And no matter the technology that's chosen by your audience whenever they're managing events, make sure that they ask the question when they're adopting or re adopting it as new or renewing their contracts. Hey, how do you engage with your customers in product development and product mm -hmm. testing? Because that'll save you a lot of headaches down the road. Sure. Uh, a, a lot of tech companies that have either entered the space, adapted, or were around maybe just pre-pandemic, um, yeah. very much... A lot of them will define themselves by the type of event they serve, whether that be a virtual event or a hybrid event. Yeah. Is is everything that we're talking about today, can it be put into there or is this for all events? Does it matter whether it's live and in person or digital? Can we use these same processes? Um, with Blackthorn, the answer is yes. Uh, with some applications, the answer is no. And that's because of, as you said, when they were built, how they were built and what audience they're trying to work for. Sure. Um, you know, a good chunk of the organizations that we work with are uh, education based and nonprofits. And even okay, before yeah. uh, the pandemic hit, they were already there was already a trend in those industries to doing more things virtually so that you could either pack more things in a day, which is sort of the negative way of looking at it, or being more productive with stakeholders throughout the week or the month, which is the more positive way of looking at it. And so we had already built some of the technology into our core platform to allow you to have video-based or virtual events and video-based or virtual sessions within events yeah. to provide a hybrid virtual or live experience. And in fact, if you sort of watch our social handles and watch our space towards the end of the year, you might see a few new advancements, really cool advancements okay. in that area as well. And I'd be happy to come on and chat with you about that again once it's out. Um, but we designed it so that, um, if you do want to do hybrid or virtual events in addition to live, you can if you yep. want to do live and occasionally do a virtual committee meeting, you can, and that's helped our customers, uh, who we really view as our partners sort of dive into the pandemic world and start to come out of it, uh, very easily without having to change their event technologies to meet the changing needs of the world. Sure. It was not flexible enough to be able to handle all of that. Mm. I'm I'm curious to get your take on something that we've discussed recently on the podcast, and it was sure. um, with uh, a, 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 another guest of ours um, who was looking at data that we can now analyze mm -hmm. following the first couple of years of delivering virtual and hybrid events in the way that we understand it now in the last two years um the time has flown by and it almost caught me off guard that we're now in a, a position where we have metrics we have data we have statistical analysis of how we interact with virtual and hybrid events now what oh, yeah. works what doesn't work I, I i'm curious to sort of get your handle on what event metrics you know event technology should be capturing and what organizers should be capturing now it does it depend on the type of the event or is there now a core list of data and metrics that really every event should be capturing i think it's going to depend on the event type and i'll circle back around to that for live events i think we're starting to see a resurgence of the old metrics out that we were using pre-pandemic, right? We For live events, we're seeing overall attrition versus registration. We're seeing session engagement. We're seeing uh, quiz engagement and, and polling, uh, heat mapping sometimes if it's a large enough conference and you have the technology to track where people are walking and going yeah, to yeah. sessions and uh, all of that. 
but I think we have to add in the lens uh, for 2022 and I, I think into 2023 as well of seeing upward or static trends in those across all the events that an organization has. Because we are still in this phase where we're emerging from the pandemic world. Yes, we're not, yeah. we haven't emerged past tense at this point, right? We're emerging yes. um, present tense. So we do need to track all of these, the trends that come to that. And I, I wish there was some sort of maybe open source database where we could all share that with each other. Um, that would be that would be really interesting, Hello. right? <laughs> There's yeah, idea. right. Sort of a wiki for for these event trends. That would be that would be a really really cool way of seeing if it's industry specific, geography specific, what have you. Yeah. Um, but there are great analytics tools. There's Tableau. There's Einstein. There's even Power BI for Microsoft users. Although Microsoft users, please get in touch with me. Let's talk about Salesforce. There's a better way. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I love Microsoft, but there is a better way to manage your CRM. Trust me. Um, it, it, it's um, um, so I, I I certainly think that there. There, there are ways of mapping those trends and keeping that in touch. But virtual events, I think we also need to start tracking the metrics downwards. Holy virtual events, I think we've reached a point of peak engagement probably about a year ago uh, okay. with those. Um, there will always be an audience for virtual events, and there will always be an audience for hybrid events. I think the pandemic has shown mm -hmm. that the audience exists. It's just the size of that audience that will change over time. And yeah. um, being able to to see, hey, you know, actually on my entirely virtual conference, I've done this in 2020, 2021, 2022. I've noticed that engagement with vendors at virtual booths has gone down as a trend in three years, right? Yeah. Next year, do I need to move to hybrid or maybe back to live? And then I make the virtual engagement sort of a, a part of that vendor offering or that sponsor offering as opposed to a all that I'm offering my sponsors. Because if that's it and I've noticed a downward trend in engagement, I'm gonna it's gonna lead to fewer sponsors and vendors <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. For next year. So I, I I think in addition to what we were using pre-pandemic, and I realize this is sort of the long way of doing it, but TLDR, right? Um, it's not just uh, the metrics we were using pre-pandemic, it's the trends that go along with it with time, using that as an added dimension. Yeah, uh, yeah. And, and you, I, I'm going to hark back just a couple of minutes to something you said, which is that we are still emerging. We have not yet emerged. And I think that's something that that we've overlooked, forgotten, maybe not realized in 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 many formats, but, you know, particularly in the event space, yeah. is that, you know, I look out my window, there's traffic on the street outside, mm -hmm. you know, the kids are in school, you know, we can go to the pub, we can go to bars, there are gigs, there are concerts, all those social things that, you know, that we, that we lost and, you know, took for granted, maybe it came back. And to some extent, you know, you can be forgiven for waking up in the morning and, and forgetting that that, that whole blip ever happened. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and yet then I hear from a business who says, oh, yeah, we're organizing our big Christmas, um, you know, end of year conference and meeting. It'll be the first time we've done it since the pandemic. And I'm like, oh, crap, because over over here, I don't know what it was like, you know, it, 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 stateside. But running up to Christmas 21, we had a bit of a COVID surge again in the country. Oh, yeah. And oh, the yeah. restriction in the UK was that if you were pos tested positive, you still had to isolate for 10 days. Yep. And so what happened was 10 days before Christmas last year, everything dropped off a cliff. There were no events. Events got cancelled left, right and centre. Pubs were empty. Restaurants, bookings were being cancelled in restaurants oh, yeah. because everyone thought, well, hold on. If we test positive now, that's our Christmas, you know, Christmas day is ruined. Yep. So I forget sometimes, this is a long-winded way of saying that I, I certainly am guilty of forgetting, guilty of forgetting sometimes that there are still things going to happen this year and at the end of this year and into the early part of 23 yeah. that haven't happened since the pandemic. You know, we are still very much emerging from that, regardless of how normal life looks out there. And, and we're still learning every day with, with technology like this and how it can help us and how we manage our events. You know, there's still a lot of stuff that we're wet behind the ears on. Yeah, I, I completely agree with you uh, when it comes to that. It's 
And people, as you said, people can be forgiven about it, about it because there is a bit of a confirmation bias when you look at it, or at least an observation bias at the end of the day, right? Mm -hmm. You go about your life in the way that makes sense to you. And so you're naturally going to see more people going about your uh, their lives in a way that makes sense, similar to how you your life makes sense to you. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you're not going to see the people necessarily who are still at home or the people who still choose to wear masks when they go inside of a Tesco's, right? Yeah. Uh, it's you, you may not be able to you, – you're not going to view that as much. It just becomes part of the wallpaper in the background. And again, you can be forgiven for that. But we but are still emerging. Yeah. That's an interesting point that you raised about the, the I was at an event just this weekend. You know, I returned late last night yeah. from, from one of the big convention centers in, in the UK. And I, I, I saw at least a handful of people who are still choosing to wear a face yeah. covering as they go around because they feel comfortable with that. And oh, yeah. I'm, I'm not suggesting that we get to bring it back to the conversation today. I'm not suggesting that we, we, we sort of become like big brother, but you know, personal information and, and things that make our audiences and our delegates and customers mm -hmm. feel comfortable coming to an event or participating in an event that comes back to stuff that could be noted and, 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 and in salesforce and using the tools that you've described today we can note all of that stuff we can use that then to form a more personal engagement experience on a delegate by delegate basis or a supplier by supplier basis Oh, very easily. I mean, it's just as simple as adding a form, and we do this, we call it a form element in our product, but uh, adding, saying, what's your level of comfort, comfort interacting with other people? And you do it as sort of a rag uh, pick yeah. list, right? Red, amber, yeah. green. Yeah. And red is, you know what, I don't, I don't want to touch people, I'm not ready to hug, but I'm more than happy to wave at you from a distance, right? <laughs> uh, you give an amber or a yellow, and you can do this as wristbands or tags on lanyards, right? There's yeah, really yeah. easy ways of handling this. Uh, an amber would be like, maybe I'll do a fist bump, right? Or, you know, something, yeah. a little, little, little bit of a distance, but I'm there for you. Um, and then green would just be bring it in. We're hugging it up. I have in two years, we're gonna, we're gonna do that. <laughs> bring it um, yeah, bring it in, right? Yeah. Um, but all of that can be easily tracked on an attendee record, on a contact record, right inside of the CRM. And the event is the way of gathering that data so that you can interact appropriately and store that information for future engagements with that same individual. Mm. We are talking today, and we have been talking today on the Event Industry News podcast to the Director of Technology Evangelism and Product Marketing at Blackthorn, Mr. Matt Frank. Um, and as we sort of, with one eye on the clock, you know, start wrapping up um, today's episode, Matt, um, it, it would be remiss of me to have you on here and not ask about, you know, the, the roadmap um, for, for Blackthorn in the next few months. You know, you you, you already alluded to, to people keeping an eye on, on maybe your feeds and things and stuff that's happening. You know, as a technology company, you've always got stuff in development. But um, you know, is there anything you can tell us about what what may be on the horizon for the end of twenty two and into twenty three? Sure, um, I, I did mention we're doing some some great advancements in the virtual event space. Uh, so watch our channel sort of around the end of the calendar year uh, for more information on that. Uh, it there may be something of a virtual events platform that can be used in a hybrid capacity and grows with you as an organization that may or may not be coming. I can't really quite say it too much now. Um, there's also some e-commerce stuff that's coming out. We're making managing memberships and subscriptions way easier inside of Salesforce. And all of this is developing towards things like uh, attendee mobile apps, dynamic questions and forms, all of these really great new UIs that we can take advantage of and even capacity management through incorporation of some AWS technologies into what we're doing. All of this is coming towards the end of the year and into 2023 to the great advantage of our customers. And the best part about it is if you're already a licensed customer of our applications, these upgrades that come into the events product, that come into the payments product, they come for free with it, which is mm -hmm. a really cool thing. That's the great part about SaaS software, right? So check us out, Twitter at Blackthorn IL on YouTube, same thing, at Blackthorn IL. And we're on LinkedIn as well, Blackthorn.io. And you'll see all sorts of announcements, event presence announcements all towards the end of the year. And in case you haven't guessed it yet, Blackthorn.io. 
on the web. Um, have a look at have a look at what the guys are up to, and I'm sure people can find you as well on LinkedIn as well as Blackthorn. You know, if they want to connect with you and and maybe get take, make the discussion a, a little bit more in person, if you if you search for Matt, I'm sure you're on on the various platforms. Oh yeah, just find me, Matthew Frank. I'm right on there, Blackthorn, right in my title, uh, Director of Technology Evangelism. I'd love to chat with you about events, event technology, uh, trends we're seeing in different industries that we work with, or just, you know, I have it written in there halfway as a joke, but uh, how to make a mean spicy mayonnaise is also in my bio, and I'm more than happy to let you in on the secrets. The, 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 you've sold, you had me at mayo. Uh, <laughs> you had me at you had me at mayo, and you had me pinned down when you said spicy. So yeah, I'm in. I'm all in for that. Um, got, <laughs> Matt, it's been great to speak to you today. And you mentioned sort of finding out about event technology and and, and all that sort of stuff. It it, it um it would be useful maybe for me to point out and just remind regular listeners of the uh, podcast about event tech live um we're recording this at the start of october on monday the 3rd of october so uh, the, the likelihood is that you're listening to this hopefully at some point during october event tech live um it returns in november this year in london um on wednesday the 16th and thursday the 17th of november but it's really important to let everybody know that we have a new home this year, uh, XL London. We're moving from our previous home and where we grew and developed at the Truman Brewery. And this year, Event Tech Live will be in uh, XL London. So a new home for uh, the show that is dedicated to event technology. Um, a great lineup of speakers and suppliers and everything event tech related is going to be under one roof at XL London on Wednesday the 16th and Thursday the 17th of November this year. So please do uh, register for that if you can get along to it. Fantastic. We're going to be doing um, a, a virtual day with uh, speakers and a lineup of sessions from people who are going to be dialing in from all around the world on Tuesday the 15th. But the in-person event itself is the 16th and 17th of November. So forgive me, Matt, for crashing your podcast today. Oh, no, that's uh, but, great. But, but, there, but there is um, there is our plug for Event Tech Live. And it's got to that time of year where we should uh, give, our, give our friends over at that show a, a good mention and, um, and a good shout out for what they're going to be doing this year so yeah it brings us to the end of, of today's episode um let, let's bring it back in house to event industry news and just remind people that if you're listening to the audio version of today's podcast make sure you go over to eventindustrynews.com check out the latest news features and supplements that are available on the website as well as of course the a to z supplier directory whether or not you are based in the usa or in the uk or in europe or further afield than that um the a to z supplier directory has got a pretty comprehensive list of suppliers and services if you are an organizer within the events industry, particularly if you're looking for a technology provider such as Blackthorn, you can uh, go go, in, go into there and you can find loads of different options for whatever it is that you're doing. Of course, if you're already on the Event Industry News website, hello to you and thanks for watching today. Don't forget to go in the opposite direction and make sure that you are subscribed wherever you get your podcasts from to our audio only versions of the podcast so that you get updated with each episode as it drops and uh that brings us to the end of today's particular recording um, matt it's been a pleasure to meet you um all the way from denver colorado today um good luck with everything at blackthorn stay in touch we'd love to uh, get you back on the podcast again as a as a returning uh, guest and um we were talking a bit of sports before uh, today's recording and i mentioned the broncos and there was you know uh, hesitancy i suppose <sighs> you know what i'm just gonna shout out to my friends over at craven cottage um uh that's really the team i'm pulling for right now I, I, i'm going i'm going well, back to my days well they need uh, it as maybe, well let me tell you that they need it as well they, <laughs> oh, <laughs> they need this. maybe we should get the broncos and fulham together Oh, my God. It's like they share a coaching staff almost. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> Guys, thanks very much for listening to today's podcast. It was an absolute pleasure as always. And uh, we'll see you on the next episode. Stay safe, everybody.